The day began with the sort of reckless curiosity that only comes with the invincibility of youth. My friends and I, five in total, stumbled upon the shell of a house that time had forgotten. Its windows were soulless eyes, and its door hung open like a dark mouth waiting to swallow us whole. The local legend said it was cursed, a place where reality warped and twisted. We, armed with bravado and the desire for an adventure, dared each other to cross its threshold. Inside, the air was thick with the scent of decay. The layout was nonsensical, hallways looping back on themselves and stairs leading to nowhere. It was Jake who found the first door, hidden behind a peeling wallpaper. It was an ordinary door, but its very ordinariness in such a place felt unsettling. With a mix of excitement and fear, we watched as he opened it. The room beyond was impossible. It stretched far wider than the house's exterior suggested, an endless library filled with whispers but no words. Jake entered, and the door slammed shut behind him. We waited, calling his name, but there was no response. When the door finally creaked open, Jake stumbled out, pale and silent. He wouldn't speak of what he saw, but the love for books he once had turned into an aversion overnight. Encouraged by the mystery, we pressed on, each finding a door that seemed to call to us. Sarah found hers next, a door that led to a room of mirrors. She was always the vain one, but the room twisted her self-love into a nightmare. She emerged hours later, her eyes haunted, whispering about reflections that showed her aging, dying, decaying. Tom's door revealed a room filled with clocks, ticking in unison. Time moved differently there, he said later, each second an agony, reflecting his constant battle with impatience and his fear of time slipping away. He came back to us aged, his hair touched with gray that wasn't there before. Liam faced a door that led to a stormy night, even though the sun shone brightly outside. His fear of storms had always been his secret shame. When he returned, his fear was gone, replaced by a quiet resignation and a faraway look that spoke of things seen that could never be unseen. Then it was my turn. My door was plain, unassuming, but it filled me with dread. I stepped through it and found myself in a room that was a perfect replica of my own, except for the shadows that seemed to move with a life of their own. Whispered voices filled the air, voicing every doubt, every insecurity I'd ever had. The door vanished, leaving me trapped with my darkest thoughts until I faced them, acknowledged them. We regrouped, changed in ways we couldn't articulate, each carrying the weight of our encounters. But it was the final door that awaited us all, a door we hadn't noticed before standing ajar, beckoning us to our collective fear. Behind it was not a room but an abyss, a void that threatened to swallow us whole. The house demanded one last challenge, to face the unknown, the ultimate fear. We linked hands, stepping into the darkness together, a united front against whatever awaited us. But unity was not enough. The abyss tested us, our bonds, our wills. In the end, only I emerged, stepping out into the daylight alone, the house silent and empty behind me. My friends were gone, taken by the house that feeds on fears and secrets. I alone had faced the void and returned, but at what cost? The house remains, a silent sentinel in our neighborhood. No one speaks of it, and no one dares approach it anymore. I pass it sometimes, wondering if my friends found peace or if they're still wandering its endless rooms, facing their fears over and over. I learned that day that some doors are best left unopened, for what lies behind them can change you in ways you can't imagine. The house on the edge of our reality waits, patient and hungry, for the next daring soul to challenge its mysteries. And I, forever marked by my passage through its doors, carry the memories of my friends and the knowledge that some fears are shared but some are faced alone.